My name is Vindu Kumari Bhatia and I'm a teacher at SR Capital Public School in Delhi. It's a privilege to be here in Dubai, representing teachers not just from India, but teachers across the world working, as I am to be a teacher change maker. I work as a teacher in a country with many challenges, like large class sizes, shortage of teachers, and lack of focus on learning outcome. But like many other teachers, I won't change, and I believe that I can contribute to this change by innovating in my own school. So to keep us focused on ground realities and the importance of teachers being a part of the solution to this education reform, I would like to share one idea that I have developed to improve the learning outcome. Actually, I teach English in primary section, class third, fourth, and fifth, where the children <coughs> struggle to connect their, the poetry section to their real life. So far as prose is concerned, they take a lot of interest, they ask questions, they interact, but when it comes to the turn of a poetry, they struggle to connect it to their daily life. So to overcome this problem, I use their ability to remember the lyrics of famous Bollywood songs as a tool. What I did is that I replaced the lyrics of the songs, famous songs, which the children like, with the actual words of the poem and sang it like that song. And you know, you wouldn't believe it worked like a magic in my class. Even the, even the most inactive child started taking interest. I can show you a demo. Uh, there was a poem in class fourth. Grandpa dropped his glasses once in a pot of dye, and when he put them on, he saw a purple sky. And, the, and that time, last session, a famous song, uh, there was a famous song, Kola Varidi, you might have heard. The children used to sing that. I said, okay, if you, you don't want to read poem, we'll just sing that song. Started with the poem, song, uh, why this Kola Vari, Kola Vari, Kola Vari di. And, and I slowly, gradually, I just replaced the lyrics of the song with the actual words of the poem. Grandpa dropped his glasses in a pot of dye. And you know, it worked like a magic. 100% of the students took interest. Not only that, they started exploring the meaning of the difficult words in the poem. It increased their confidence level. They took, started taking part in the poem recitation in, during assembly in, and other competitions also. So uh, it, was, uh, it was just an idea which uh, they call, STIR Education calls uh, micro-innovation. So thank you very much, and please enjoy the panel discussion. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for that. I was just going to say, come on, give us a demo, but you were there ahead of us, and, and very good it was too. Uh, my name is Anne McElvoy. I'm public policy editor of The Economist, and cover education is a large part of that brief, and also BBC broadcaster. Very pleased today to have such a varied and distinguished panel on stage. Uh, they're going to speak in a moment. I will introduce them. But of course, we're very keen to have your input as well. So I'm going to leave a fair bit of time to go back and forwards to the floor. We've got a few noises off, but I think we've probably all been through greater hardship. So if we rally together, we can somehow uh, overcome this slight distraction. So let me, uh, let me introduce the panel who've been kind enough to give me a pronunciation lesson in several languages in advance, and let, let's see how I fare. So uh, next to me is Idris Duzo, who is Education Minister in Malaysia. Welcome to you. Uh, next to him is Dr. Zhou Ming Aung, Deputy Minister of Education from Myanmar. Lovely to have you with us today. Uh, and next to him is Mr. Guang Jo Kim, who is UNESCO Director based in Bangkok in Thailand, but I'm sure we'll also speak a bit more broadly as well. And finally, on my far left and your far right is Mr. Kamaludin, who is president of the University of Sultan Augung. Yep. Nearly, you know, I faltered, but I got there. Islamic University from Indonesia. So as you see, we've got a, a, a quite a, a wide range of input ahead of us. I think the 
questions about Asia Pacific and education are fascinating for a number of reasons. If you sit in your offices in the center of London, cover education from where I do, although I do travel a lot, including to Asia, you have a number of buzzwords in your mind about Asia. Well, the main one being envy. There is a lot of, of envy and aspiration towards some aspects, not all, but some aspects of Asian education systems. On the other hand, there are also huge challenges and problems facing various Asian countries when it comes to their education system. Uh, the main one is one that you'll have heard about in other contexts today, but which is rather acute in Asia Pacific, and that is the mismatch between skills that school children leave with and university students offer to employers and what employers want. I think there is an interesting uh, piece of research by ADECO which said that 59% of Thai companies couldn't find suitable candidates for opportunities. Similar gaps mirrored in Malaysia and elsewhere. We might get perspectives in a second on why that is. Perhaps even more worrying than that is the fact that unemployment, and particularly youth unemployment, is high and that nearly a half of global unemployment is in the Asia-Pacific reason. That alone, on its own merits, would be reason for concern. But also, we do know, and not least uh, in this part of the world where, where we are gathered, that it easily impacts on instabilities and is accredited as being one of the reasons behind, certainly not the only reason behind, but a major motivator behind, perhaps, some of the angrier outbursts of the Arab Spring, that sense of frustration among young people that whatever they do, they can't really thrive and prosper in their own societies. The last thing we want is for them to turn to less palatable solutions, so education is surely a part of the answer. But how to go about that varies, and I think the various strictures, both in spending, culturally, and state of knowledge about how to approach these things varies. And that's why I'm particularly interested to get this spread of opinion on the panel today. Um, they're going to basically in introduce themselves in a kind of haiku-like form in which they will speak for three to four minutes, no more, please, uh, just really on their it's pitch. Topic. Pitching it. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's my job, isn't it? Yeah, no, I will stop you, if only because, you know, it'd be very nice to have a bit more interaction. Yeah. And I do think as we move on in the day, um, a bit like sort of five year olds, our tolerance for long presentations probably drops, but our, our uh, appetite for lively discussion rises. So if I could, um, could you just start with you? And if you could just talk, I'm so sorry. Idris, Idris is going to, to take us away on the first presentation. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, I would like to take you with this big, big issue on the Arab Spring here. Uh, what's uh, the product? Arab Spring is a product of uh, social media, so a product of technology, and also a product of uh, social issues. It's not just uh, unemployment alone. It's a product of good governance, economic growth, and um, unemployment is being said. But in Malaysia, I, I would say that um, that is not going to be a surge because uh, our political stability has been there. We won the last election. Uh, leadership has been good. Mahathir has set up the right path for us, uh, Vision 2020, followed by Najib. And um, we have policy for bottom 40. And uh, we have women in education. We have, surely we have problems with women in education because too many of them. <laughs> It's not the issue of not having women because my Secretary General is a woman, Dr. Medina, and my Deputy Director General of Education, Prof. Dr. Is, is here. Where, where are you? Johnson. Prof. Dr. Rosie. Where are you, Rosie? She has gone out. She's gone out on oh a protest God. at you saying there were too oh, many right. women. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if there is economic growth, we are experiencing 5% growth for the last few years. The fiscal economy is, is good. The debt equity ratio is good. And uh, fiscal deficit is maintained 3%. Inflation is not 3%. Investment has been growing. Uh, private investment has been growing for the last three years. So uh, and the ease of doing business, we're number six in the world. Ease of credit facilities, we're number one in the world. And number four for shopping. There were a lot of people <laughs> from. <laughs> well, why not say Dubai is much better than us. Uh, that leads to the next reason why, uh, on the social issues, saying that is uh, where un unemployment is. I do concur with you saying that 
we do have mismatch in unemployment. What is being produced by universities, what's being taken out by the market, because we have half a million unemployed, besides having three million uh, foreign workers in Malaysia at the moment. Mm. So uh, it's, it's mismatch between what you learn in universities and what you learn outside. If you look at what's the reason for this mismatch, all right, it's not relevant to the marketplace. A uh, good reason for it, we never have Android developer before. We never have Zumba instructor before. We never have big data analytics before, not, not to the extent architects before. We don't have cloud service uh, specialists before, computer using the cloud now. Uh, we don't have digital marketing before, not as much. And we don't have biomedic before. Uh, that combine biology, engineering, software, psychology at one time. So these are the changes in the marketplace due to the improvement technology which we have to put the economics and the industrialists together. As such, Malaysia has come up with a TVET blueprint. Uh, last year, we have a graduate employment blueprint. Uh, government has spent uh, 400 million from 2007 to 214 till last year. And we have STEM policy, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the view of 6040 by the year 2020. So as such that we're putting policy in place, uh, we want to see a greater collaboration between the industries and higher institutions, and where higher institutions is no more an ivory tower. Mm -hmm. They have to go down. We have to see more lecturers going to the industries. We want to make sure that they get the sabbatical and work in the industries rather than just going to another university for the sabbatical. We have to see a real partnership between universities and uh, universities and industries. As such, as such that, uh, probably who can talk better about journalism than the journalists themselves? Who can talk better about fishing than fishermen themselves? Who can talk about politics than the politicians themselves? And one of them. Who can talk about software, if not the software developer themselves? Uh, it leads to further action as such that since 1999, Malaysia government has introduced uh, community colleges, which I did, I was part of the in making of the blueprint way back in 1999, and now we have 86 community colleges in, uh, in Malaysia. It's going to be increased to 212, as such that each parliamentary area would have one. Uh, we are increasing the number of polytechnics. I noticed 32. that you overrode very gracefully my, that sign, by the way, means by decapitation, right? <laughs> right. But just uh, if you could gently right. move towards your close, for now. Okay, I'll close it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, late, lately we have this, uh, we just launched the uh, education blueprint that increase, would increase soft skills of students. Mainly, uh, they, they couldn't get a job, mainly because uh, industrialists need people who have the soft skills who can go to the workplace and talk to them probably, who can speak uh, good English, who have higher order thinking skill. So hopefully uh, with the current system that we have, I'm not saying that there's no mismatch. I'm saying that what the government is doing now, hopefully we'll make sure that mismatch is not going to be there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, just for getting us off to a, a, a good start. And I'm sure we'll come back to some of those uh, those themes. I mean, the, the next speaker, Dr. Zhao Min, Zhao Min Aung, excuse me, Deputy Minister of Education, you also have a science and technology background, which I'm yes. sure will uh, will play into yes. to some of that. Why don't you give us your take, and then perhaps we might also later on talk about how we get over that bridge between science and technological demands and our education systems. Yes. Thank you. So I was the uh, deputy minister for the Ministry of Science and Technology. I was taking care of the, uh, especially on the Tibet, but uh, government of Myanmar has initiated a comprehensive education sector reform. So we are focusing on quality of the education and uh, we are going to make sure that education is connected with the market needs as in the past, Myanmar. So from 2011 onwards, we are going to refund our education. That's why we need to uh, promote uh, the skilled workers uh, in uh, various fields. That's why this reason I was transferred to the Ministry of Education, I think so. So we have the different education system regarding with the, uh, compared with the other uh, countries, neighboring countries. Uh, 
we have the, each and every ministry has their own universities. Uh, throughout the country, we have the 169th University Ministry of the uh, Science and Technology has uh, University of Science and Technology, and Ministry of Health has a University of Medicine and so on, something like that. So, uh, as my previous talk, we are going to uh, reform our education system, so our government provides much more uh, budget allocations, um, especially 12% of the over government spending. So we increase uh, uh, so 12 times or something like that. So, and uh, Myanmar, compared to many uh, its ASEAN neighbors, we, has, we have a very large education system that includes almost 8 million students, 40,000 uh, 40, schools, and 270,000 teachers. We have more than 135 ethnic groups. So at recent McKinsey <coughs> report on Myanmar, economy notes that Myanmar got four times the size of its economy until the uh, 2013. But the report finds that the current democratic and labor productivity trends to continue, Myanmar could grow by less than 4% a year. Half of its potential 8% growth a year if it's accelerated the rate of the annual labor productivity. So the youth, the demographic of Myanmar, age 15 to 28, is comprised of 30 million individuals, which constitute 40% of the working age populations. So as additions, 25% of the population is made out of people below working age. That percentage is higher than in the People Republic of the China, 90%, and Thailand is only 20%. This youth book represents an important resource with the potential to play a key role in Myanmar economic transformation. So if provided with proper skills and professional training, this cohort can supply the human capital to drive <coughs> economic growth in the Myanmar. So, however, according to the I, I mentioned previously, we have initiated comprehensive uh, reform of education. Uh, the uh, review said that uh, so we need the skill lever much more than the graduate people. So, for <coughs> example, um, we have the uh, lack of the experience for the uh, improvement of the skill development in Myanmar, and private-public partnership were also key providing opportunities for skill development. So, UNESCO partnership with Pesicolor and the Ministry of Education and Institute of Economic to establish a center of excellence in business skill development is one example of how private-public partnership can be developed to other quality skills developments. Now we are very focusing on the promotion of the uh, skill workers. We have the, and at the law regarding the skill levels, now we have the, uh, we are going to establish uh, such kind of polytech throughout the country. Now we I might ask you to go into that a little bit later, if you could just sort of begin to round off your introduction so we yeah. get everyone in. but. You know, we can certainly come back to more detail if you like. Yeah, okay. So in, in the past, uh, we have the uh, complex of skill levels in um, uh, tertiary education. That's why we, co we would like to differentiate now. So that's me. Okay, thank you. That's you. <laughs> that's you on that. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, sorry to, to just sort of truncate you a, a bit, but it'd be nice just to keep the debate flowing perhaps a bit. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Guangzhou Kim, who is director of UNESCO in, in Thailand, as I said earlier. Perhaps germane to our general discussion today uh, is also very well known, I think, as a leading education reformer in, in Korea, and particularly 
in the context of a very high-performing education system and therefore of no small interest, I think, to many people outside Asia as well as those within it, has also had a very senior education role at the World Bank. So uh, pretty much as you're all singing, all dancing, uh, education chap. Take it away, if you would. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Mo Moderator, for this nice introduction. Indeed, I'm not always nice, but yeah. on occasion. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I am the director of UNESCO office in Bangkok, uh, which is UNESCO's Asia-Pacific Regional Bureau for Education. By that, I mean we work 48 member states in Asia-Pacific, uh, covering countries like Iran in the West, uh, Central Asia, and uh, Southwest uh, Asian countries, and Simio, ASEAN countries, Far Eastern countries, and the Pacific, altogether 48 of them. So we mostly uh, work on education, but also we cover culture and other UNESCO mandated areas. Having said that, I was asked to uh, think about the, the Arab Spring in Asia Pacific term. In a nutshell, whether uh, Asian countries are prone to another type of spring, Asian version, uh, my answer would be no, based on my observation. So I'll tell you why. Well, while this region called Asia Pacific has a great similarity with uh, the Semena region, the, the <clears throat> you know, Middle East and Arab countries, and countries in North Africa, uh, in terms of uh, demography, for example, many countries in Asia, are the age profile is, is very much young. Uh, I understand in the countries like uh, Viet Vietnam and India, the average age is still under 20, the age of 25, uh, which is more or less the case in Egypt and uh, some other Arab countries, if I understand correctly. And also, some of these uh, many countries in Asia, we have we do have this gap and disparity <coughs> in terms of uh, economic wealth, uh, social service, and many others, and especially uh, the employment in general and youth unemployment in particular. We many countries in our region, Asia Pacific, we do have it this phenomenon, youth unemployment. So I would say in general, these are some similarities between two reasons. On the other hand, unlike MENA, many Asian countries, if you look into the, the demographic profile of the countries, uh, very diverse, I would say, in terms of the size of the population, uh, we can have very tiny, small island country in the Pacific, but we have a giants like China and India at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> and also the cultural language in particular. There are many languages spoken in Asia Pacific. Almost more than half of the world languages are spoken in this region of Asia Pacific, more than 3,000 of them. Um, disparity, uh, I, I said is similar, but when it comes to youth unemployment, I look at the statistics, the latest statistics from ILO, and I realized that in MENA reason, it's more than 20% when it comes to youth uh, unemployment. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Asia Pacific, on average, it still remain as a single digit, although it's eight to 9%. But as you know, the, the youth unemployment rate could be a typical two, three times bigger than the national average. So uh, the reason for behind all this, in my view, is the Asian economies of the last uh, five, ten years, I would say, have been doing relatively well compared to other regions of the world in, con in terms of growth and other reasons. And also, these economies are very diverse. So, uh, and more than anything else, this is a diverse in terms of language, religion, culture. And because of the diversity, things cannot be easily transmitted. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, unlike some MENA uh, region where at least compared to Asia, which is more homogeneous in terms of religion, language in particular. So with, with all this observation uh, about this spring, uh, I hope that this will not happen in this Asia Pacific. Nonetheless, Asia uh, Pacific countries have immense challenges. But I will conclude my remark to three questions. When it comes to mismatch, we typically talk about at a given point in time, whether we have skill shortage or skill oversupply or over education. But if we look at this uh, skill match in the, uh, over time, you will realize many Asian countries, 
not all, but some ASEAN countries over time have been able to match education and the productive sector, like my country, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, you name it. So I think sometimes we may need to uh, allow this uh, gap to happen, to, uh, to close the gap. Second thing, the question is, speaking about mismatch, uh, we always talk about education not matching up to the productive sector, but education has to be somehow behind the productive sector by nature. So the question is how far uh, education should be ahead of time or behind time. I mean, who will decide on this uh, uh, the matching things? I leave it to, uh, I leave as a question for yeah. all of students. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely, and uh, it's one I would like to dig into, and uh, people in the audience might also have thoughts and, and ideas on that. Well, uh, last speaker for this introductory round is Professor Kamaluddin from the Sultan Algun Islamic University. Yes, thank uh, you very please much. Please do respond as you go along or do your presentation and yeah. then we could uh, take in your thoughts. That's true. Uh, someone can help from behind my slide presentation. Thank you. You came with an entire kind of technological team, did right. you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've shown up yeah. the rest of okay. us already, uh, so we can just relax and have a look at this. Um, okay, that is the, let's put this one. From leading economic, uh, that they come to close. Uh, could you move back a little bit? They come slow in <laughs> I don't know how to operate it. Uh, they go fast, I don't know. They come automatically, I don't know. Uh, you need, I need a stop switch. Yes, yeah, stop for a while. Otherwise, we'll be stuck on 5,000 hours of video gaming by your average 21-year-old, which I think my teenagers have clocked that already, actually. <laughs> uh, sorry. Do you need a little Could help from... Okay, the topic is from leading economic growth to Asia doom spring of their own. That has happened? That's the question. If you look at Asia today, of course there are three main issues. Unemployment among youth of the people, yes, it exists in Asia. The second one, skill mismatch also exists in Asia. And skill gap between the output of the high education and the industrial is big. But this case may not lead to the spring in Asia. That is my uh, professional judgment after 20 years in the university. So here's the Asian challenge. Go ahead. One more. I don't know why they go this way. Man and machine in perfect yeah. harmony. Just, I think just keep going, to okay. be honest. I mean, if the it Asia comes up, challenge. it does, but we're interested anyway. Okay, Asia is regional with sustainable economic growth and recognized to have the biggest population in the world. Therefore, Asia encountered to the following challenge. Number one, education, of course. Health, food, and poverty. That's the big challenge in Asia today. To anticipate the issue that it is required that Asia should, number one, increase the amount of middle class through education, of course, and economic productivity. <coughs> but middle class in Asia today, there are two meanings. Because measured by the economic growth, you know, well, and then the creativity of the young, but economically not well yet. The second one, increase in the cooperation in education among Asian university and school as well. This is to overcome this kind of thing. Improve the creativity and productivity of the youth itself. This is the challenge in Asia today. Improve the quality of leadership and globally professional is also the challenge for Asia because many uh, Asian countries, especially the case of Indonesia, they are in work looking rather than outwork looking. So we have to encourage them to go leadership globally, professionally. That's very important. <coughs> and then 
uh, build the collaboration in the area of culture and threat. Culture and threat in Asia is very important. Like many other panelists already mentioned, the culture in Asia is so diversity, <coughs> but they can penetrate through trading because they speak in the same language, trading for the good. I allowed you a little extra time for technological reasons, but if you could just perhaps okay. come towards right. your class. <coughs> for the case of Indonesia, for example, there are three challenges in today. We are facing new member of new generation in the youth, so-called virtual generation. They are very different term, yeah, of the experience with the mobile technology, with the old one. This is the middle class. And then when they arrive in the workplace, they also need also different from those they are replacing. That's the, the challenge in you know, Indonesia. Like you mentioned that uh, the age of 21 year old in Indonesia, they're using 5,000 hour video game playing per year. Exchange to 2,000, you know, 250,000 email a year. Instant message, no number anymore because I'm, you know, imagine about that. 10,000 hours of call up, you know, <coughs> cellular phone and 3,500 hours of time online. So those new generation need different kind of education compared to the classical one. That is the challenge that I just mentioned with the, this continue, okay? Now, and also, Indonesia rank is number four in terms of playing with the uh, internet user in Asia. Number one is China, second rank is the India, the third is Japan, and fourth is Indonesia. By the way, Indonesia number one Facebook playing in Asia. Indonesia number one, because in Indonesia one person can own you know four or th two or three handphone, one person because the size of the country itself, and then up to now, mobile phone penetrate reached to more than 200 million. And the number of handphone is bigger than the number of population itself. Could you just wrap up for now okay. in, in the so next So my reasons? conclusion that in Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, the way to conduct the education in the last part of this one, maybe have <laughs> radically changed because the need of the youth is quite, you know, tremendous high in Indonesia. And this society, number of 130 million of the 250 so-called auto, autopilot society, they don't really influence by the government policy itself in education as well as in the work. Uh, for example, I'm the chairman of the high education. We consist of 3,600 university. And 10 years ago, any, you know, every youth, if they say, I graduate from state university, they are so proud. But now it's no longer. Mm -hmm. The private role is very high in Indonesia today. That's why the role of autopilot society in Indonesia, because the education is tremendous, changed the way, the lifestyle of the new generation <coughs> in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well done for conquering your own technology. <laughs> um, uh, let's have a very brief chat around the panel and then, then go to the, the floor, if we could, for some questions. Uh, uh, just to finish, if we possibly, uh, other people may raise it, but the Arab Spring question or the, the parallel. I mean, I was just uh, quite uh, curious when we were in the Myanmar uh, context. You might say you've kind of had your Arab Spring because you've had your big social and political change. To me, as someone from the West, that sounds like a very different context to some other countries in Asia, but d how different do you see it as someone trying to reform an education system in practice? So, so uh, as for me, uh, we have, in, in the past, uh, we have the good quality of the education in Myanmar. It's what's in 19, 65 or something like that. And then uh, we have established uh, uh, so many uh, universities. And, uh, we, 
uh, there is a mismatch between the needs of the market and something like that. And we have the uh, lack of the uh, skilled workers, as I mentioned. So now we are uh, trying to uh, uh, make uh, all education in practical, pragmatic reform. So we have the three strategy. One is uh, in urgently in need we have to do. For example, we can uh, reduce the um, uh, how, how can process of the uh, giving marks or grade. This is uh, we can reform in short time. And if we uh, uh, establish infrastructure of the school or something like that, we need their plan for uh, our. Uh, Plans. Uh, there is a short-term plan and long-term plan, something like that. We are. Uh, so you have a transition, but then you transition have periods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, I don't know. Did anyone else want to comment briefly again on that kind of Arab Spring paradigm and whether it's relevant to education or whether, as perhaps it strikes me from perhaps being outside the region, there might be loads of different reasons why you want to uh, reform your education system apart from wanting to avoid social upheaval. I mean, that's a fairly kind of minimum standard of expectation. Anyone like to have a word on that? Uh, do you, yes, uh, yep, Professor Kamalid. Uh, <coughs> Arab Spring is the new term uh, of the phenomena, the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, every country they have the pattern changing of the mm. society itself. Let's say the case in Indonesia. It began in 1908, long mm. time ago. Mm -hmm. When the Dutch tried to educate the people uh, using, you know, all graduate school at the time, they found that the health in society is so bad. So they formed the organization, changed that one. It's the beginning of the so-called modern movement in Indonesia, national awakening movement, they call it. And then since then, every 20 years in Indonesia, they changed. 28. 201928 this is the youth pledge they say one nation one language and uh, how do you call it? one uh, one yeah one nation one language and one flag something like that then 25 later in 1945 this independent led by of course those who are participate in the 20 years in the beginning of the changing of the country. And then those who are made the proclamation, like President Sukarno in the beginning, president, 20 years later stepped down because offered through by the educational student that come to, to the school in 1950 and then in 1965, so-called intellectual boom in Indonesia. Why? Because they found that the way they run the country and the way they teach in school is different. They have a gap, and then they keep rising. But how relevant do you find it now, the, the whole idea of using the, the concept, either as a warning or as something that you, you bear in mind when it comes to education, or is that a bit of a... a, a sounds a little bit like a sort of CNN headline. Perhaps it may not be the mm -hmm. thing that really wants to drive your education. Yeah, that, that is true, because in 96... Uh, 67, 1995, this reformation in Indonesia, but right since now. So if you put this pattern every 20 years, it may be happen in 19, uh, 2017 or 20. But it depends on the general election today. Mm. If they get, got the right president, maybe the little bit postponed. And then the new president must be uh, accommodate the new mm. aspiration of the new generation. Otherwise, they are going to have the problem. I guess this is the case of Indonesia. Uh, did anyone want a word on that, yeah, or should uh, we move on a little and, bit? And uh, as I said in my initial introduction, Arab Spring is due to social unrest, not uh, duly to the fact that there is youth unemployment alone, mm -hmm. but there's no going, there's going, there's going to be unemployment if there's no growth. The government has to make sure that there's going to be economic growth in the country. Mm -hmm. And to have growth, they must have good governance. If you have growth and you have good governance, there's not going to be... There's your safety belt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, uh, just before it, we, we go to the floor, uh, one thing that sort of puzzled me, I suppose, in the transition from what we heard this morning, and I was just chairing a lunch with Andrea Schleicher, uh, who runs the PISA study, is there's a lot of focus really on trying to make 
if you like, school systems more responsive for themselves, more autonomous. And yet some of the comments from the panel seem to sort of suggest that education is driven from ministries and that it really is the political class which drives how good an education system is. And it's true that there are many kinds of different good education system in the world, but I would just love to get a feeling from anyone on the, uh, the panel how true they think that is, or is there a danger in some Asian countries that the sort of politics and the role of politicians and the state can become overpowerful, may not let through the kind of innovation that I think you've all said in various ways you, you think you, you need. Yes, would you Perhaps like I may be in a better on? position to comment on that. If Go for <coughs> it. If <allow> me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it is true that in some countries, not all, in Asia Pacific, uh, uh, state parties, or I mean the politicians, ministers, excellencies have a much greater role when it comes to uh, the way the education is being formulated and delivered. But on the other hand, we begin to see uh, uh, greater voices coming from private sector in, uh, I would say, in almost all the countries in Asia Pacific. Uh, <clears throat> now, again, this, uh, the speaking about education, Andres Schleicher was talking about the skills, etc. But in my humble opinion, we talk too much about so-called this uh, basic skills or fundamental skills, mostly cognitive, what one would call cognitive dimension of education mm -hmm. or learning. But we all understand that for us to make a better world, education should not be just about the competition or co hard skills, the cognitive skills. Education should be able to teach youngsters how to behave well in a society, uh, how to go for solidarity, unity, etc., etc. And for that, non-cognitive, transversal type of skills may also equally important. I, I can see from my experience in Bangkok, uh, the Regional Bureau for <coughs> Education, many countries are very well aware of this. Uh, these three uh, distinguished panelists from my countries, by, by the way, uh, happen to be ASEAN countries. ASEAN, 10 countries now going to forge what they call ASEAN 2015, something equivalent to EU. Uh, as such, they need more than uh, <coughs> anything else, the kind of solid regional or sub-regional unity. For that, they, I, I can see that the ministers, I mean, including your excellency minister from Malaysia, Myanmar, Indonesia, they all agree on one thing, which is for ASEAN countries to need to work together, need to understand each other better, unity. Mm -hmm. So again, this non-cognitive dimension of skills or competencies is uh, mm -hmm. perhaps more important for us to make a better world. And this has not been emphasized enough. So speaking about Arab Spring, uh, uh, it would be terribly long if uh, one look at the source of this spring as a you know, an over education or youth unemployment mm -hmm. alone. So there are many other uh, uh, dimensions that we need to consider. Does anyone on the panel think the state, they can say it about someone else's country if they don't want to say it about their own, is a bit over? There's too much focus on the state and not enough on civil society or other stakeholders in education. Any comments? You're, you're right, and uh, education is becoming, has got to be more participative nowadays. You're right. It cannot be state driven anymore. It's, it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, people have access to information nowadays. Uh, they get, they get, they get to know what they need to know, whether you want them to know it or not. It's not just conventional newspaper. They get to know about it. So hence, in Malaysia, when we launched our blueprint uh, last year, we, we get in touch with 55,000 citizens. Okay? Mm -hmm. We get in touch with blogs, with their uh, memorandums. Well, we have town hall meetings before we come up with our mm -hmm. uh, blueprint. So you're right in the sense that education has got to be more participative and schools got to be given greater autonomy. Ah, but would you era. hand over power to someone else? Would you say, you guys, you know better than me how to deliver a, a high-tech education system, or would you still want to hold the reins as the minister? Well, we have to be, the world has changed. It's no more that uh, a minister knows all anymore. It's a bit, it's been uh, the time when government mm. knows everything is mm. over. You know, it's been it's uh, interesting Tony Blair made been, that point, didn't uh, he, no, when he man, said man, the job Even our Najib or Prime Ministers keep on saying that in the cabinet, yeah. the time when the government knows everything is over. So uh, you're right, education has got to be more participative. We have to listen more, 
We have to give it greater autonomy to the schools. Yeah, sorry, a couple Just more. Just quickly, uh, Your Excellency, you may uh, recognize the fact that uh, our team in Bangkok work with your, your staff to prepare the blueprint. I think yeah. I remember one yeah. of our recommendation was to, to have a, a, a stakeholder dialogue. And indeed, the government of Malaysia did that in, in the process of preparing the, the blueprint. The NGOs, uh, and it was yeah. listened to? Yeah, we listened to them. We did. Yeah, let me. <laughs> Cash of Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just a slight and, degree. And yeah, stakeholder dialogue can go one way or the other. Yeah. I'm sure a room full of stakeholders knows that very well. Yes. It's like when the Russians say, I'm listening to you, and you think, no, you're not. <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah, in the case of Indonesia, sometimes the government officials are afraid to the NGO mm. because too strong. Mm -hmm. mm. Indonesia. The role of NGO is too strong, including the education itself. That's why. Why is it too strong? The strong, this means that they raise the voice and criticize the government, and sometimes the government doing nothing. Are you yeah. not being, a, you know, are you putting the cart before the horse? I mean, if they can see a different way to do something, yeah, because the is that necessarily a problem? Right, that's why the so called autopilot society is happening now in Indonesia. What does this mean? They just create whatever they want. They don't care really the government policy so much. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they against the government. Uh, just because there are so big room now that the private, the creativity, individual as well as the organization can develop their own way. Mm -hmm. And then the government just say, okay. That's, that's one way of reaching a decision, I suppose. Yeah. Shall we have some questions um, from the audience? We'd love to hear from you or brief comments. Thank you very much. Got a couple of hands. Why don't we take, uh, I'm sure there's a microphone. A lady in the, the lovely pink dress here towards the front, and then there was a hand over there. But we'll, we'll take the lady first. Can you have a microphone, please? Honestly, I'm going to instigate a prize for the, chick, fa chick. the fastest microphone wielder in the conference center. <coughs> Thank Just you. introduce yourself if you could. Uh, I'm Pat Preedy. I'm the Chief Academic Officer for Early Childhood for GEMS. And um, I was very interested in that debate between the freedom of the school and then the state control. I have another hat on as a reporting inspector in the, in, in the UK. Uh, and what, what I would say <laughs> is that um, you need to have those checks and balances. As, as the state, you are the guardian of the welfare and safeguarding of those children. And so there's the balance of of making sure that you've got those standards, those requirements, the governance, um, as well as giving that uh, freedom. And maybe you can't hand over that freedom until you're sure that those checks and balances and that quality assurance are in place. Fine, thank you. Um, why don't we take the second question as well? Just give us a bit more uh, to ruminate upon, if you're ready, to, sir. Who had their hand up? There you are. Sorry, it isn't a sir at all, it's a madam. Excuse uh, me. Thank you very much uh, for that discussion. My name is Esperanza Ndege. I'm from Kenya. I'm uh, the director of the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning. And uh, um, uh, Kamar, Kamarudin, yeah, you talked about the uh, students spending 3,500 hours online. Oh, yes. Now, when they spend such time, are they doing, are they doing um, anything constructive in the online? Are they, is it education? Is it that they are discussing in the discussion forums? Or what kind of activities are they engaged in online, online to spend that much time? Right, that, that's a very good, good place to, to start, I think, with Professor Kamalud in there. I mean, the, the, the sense of the question being, are they merely getting very good at playing Angry Birds? Or, or is there a potential here that you can, you can yes. see and perhaps other panel members can see and then we'll yeah, also uh, reflect the GEMS question too. The new generation in Indonesia, up to 21, are very familiar with the uh, so-called internet and then we call it a TGIF generation. TGIF stands for Twitter, Google, iPhone and Facebook. Mm -hmm. I'm mm. quite relieved when you think of what it could have stood for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we call it TGIF generation. The question for me as educator, 
is the content of the exchange, the information? That is the big question. May not relevant for education itself, but among them, they are happy with that. Uh, this one, come to you, question that, mismatch about the content of the technology itself with the guideline of the government uh, for using the mobile technology for education must be, uh, you know, the government should be hurry because the government, they, you know, they have no idea how to do that, frankly speaking. If they try, they are left behind because they use much more advanced because they learn among them and then the government cannot catch up with the policy itself. Because you, they set up the policy, you have to go to the parliament, take a year, and then they quit just overnight. That is the case in Indonesia. That's what worry me about this kind of thing. And this is the reason why uh, for the next five years in Indonesia, this will be the big issue. But this may not offer through the government, of course, for this issue. But the, educational issue in Indonesia for the next five years, especially the role of technology as one of the center, no longer as a tool of the education itself is very important. Why? Because Indonesia is an archipelagic country. We have uh, 17,500 islands, right? 15,500 islands and the people who live in remote area the only way to reach with them for high education through the ICT, that is the belief, at least myself, and this time I campaign for this one in my country. Thank you. Guangzhou Kim, can I bring you in? Could you cross the bridge, perhaps, between the questions for us? Because they have a natural link, don't they? One is about sort of technology and innovation, and is it really driving things in a good way educationally? And then, of course, the, the uh, question from the GEMS lady is also, uh, an inspector on then, well, what is the role of the state and is it, is it simply as a sort of bottom line guarantor or something perhaps a bit more? <clears throat> well, um, as for the first issue about the <coughs> check and balance, I do agree with your point, but I think it depends on the country's, country's specificities. Uh, I, w I hope that the Deputy Minister, His Excellency, will agree with me. Uh, for a country like in Myanmar, I mean, they still have to uh, develop their private sector, NGO, yeah. civil sector. In the process of transformation, I think one can easily uh, expect that the government play a bigger role. So when it comes to higher education, we had a big meeting just the last month about yeah. consolidating higher education. I have yet to provide my own thoughts about it, whether it's good for consolidation, whether it, it, the government may take an alternative route whereby they can expand the system in a rel relatively short time span. For all this, they need a the bigger role for the government. Of course, in, in doing so, there has to be some other entity to you know, counterbalance or that, you know, the, of course you have a, uh, Madame let's hear, yeah, let's yeah, Aung San Suu Kyi. Pa pa pass Sorry, it yeah. along, uh, it's so well, long. So yeah. do you want to say something to conclude? Can, can I say one more yeah, thing about technology? Not. Well, in Asia Pacific, uh, we do have this, uh, ongoing debate about the use of technology in education. We have a ministerial for each and every year. We did deal with all these issues downside, but overall I must tell you that uh, uh, we are very hopeful. I mean, uh, especially for a big country like Indonesia with the, the archipelago, so many islands. Yes, I agree that uh, there's more potential than danger. And uh, it's, it's a matter of teacher education and the government adjustment rather than Kiss, you know, behaving differently, in my view. Yeah. So, Mihan, do you want to okay. come in there? Uh, we have opened up in 2011, uh, so we are going to new democratic uh, country. At the time, uh, uh, we emerged the uh, parliament, and uh, for the, for example, for the drawing of the national education law, representative from the uh, parliament. Uh, uh, join with uh, uh, ministry and ministry uh, representative joined with the parliament sessions. And also we have the, uh, we conduct a lot of uh, workshop uh, throughout the grassroots level and then uh, division and region level. And last uh, week we have the national level. Uh, so we collect all uh, suggestions and recommendations for drafting the national education law. 
So Do you know what I'm going to say? And it's a bit of a challenge to you, and I hope you yeah. don't think it's impolite, but it sounds fantastically bureaucratic. Do you think that possibly as a result of trying to do a difficult transition from a one sort of hierarchical society, it's quite possible that you end up with an education system which sort of keep, it might change the values and have much more enlightened and better values, but keeps a lot of that bureaucracy? And how then are you going to allow innovation to flow through that? So, yes. Do you know what I mean? With these different levels because I think a lot of certainly a lot of European systems of basically are, are either still in it or are thinking about what to do about it that you can end up with lots of levels all accountable to each other and yet actually trying to move performance with that model is quite hard uh, so but we have the drafted draft law based on drafted law they have they put they give the inputs and yeah. their comments, so something like that. So, so uh, we have the we got the ninety percent agreement uh, throughout the uh, various level who interested in the reformation of education. So th that's uh, why we are doing now. Yeah. decentralization. Yeah, okay. decentralization. You think you can make that kind of decentralization yeah. work? Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, point to you, if you look at education, it's not it's not one size fits all. Okay, Malaysia. The last 20 years, we are focusing on building schools. We are focusing on building more universities or colleges. Now we have enough schools, kind of, not to say uh, where we'll stop building. We have a good number of colleges. Uh, we took anybody who wanted to become teachers before could become teachers. We just come and sign, uh, mm -hmm. keep with colleges, and you become teachers. No, it's not anymore nowadays. If you don't get a good result, if you're not the top 30% of top students mm -hmm. after your grade um, 12, something like that, you're, you cannot become teachers in Malaysia anymore. Mm -hmm. So now we're moving towards quality. It's not just, uh, so it's not easy, if, if it's not apple to apple, because we're moving from accessibility to education towards quality education as time goes on. Your last metaphor reminded me of the discussant who said once, Oh, well, you're comparing apples and pears, to which someone else on the panel said, well, they're both fruit. Uh, any other questions? I like pineapple uh, better. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we've got eight minutes, so we've got to have, have a really tight back, yeah. round here. And I'd love to get, let's get all three questions, and then you're all going to have to be super brief in chat show mode. Go on. Uh, good Thank afternoon. Um, my question is a little bit more um, political-based, if you'll entertain it. Um, Education is first and foremost in the hands of the government, is at the, at the prerogative of the government. How does the international community, if it can or if it is ethical of it, prevent um, education from becoming a political tool in the country? Great. Okay, very nice direct question. Uh, let's grab the other two if we could. Thank you. Sir, next one. Good afternoon. My name is Himmat Dhillan. My question is to Professor Dr. Kamla Dean. Uh, doctor, we have you know a lot of philosophy from Indonesia, especially in education. For example, there is uh, Ki Hajar Devantaro, and there is also Ibu Kartini. So, Doctor, my question is: when we have so much of philosophy, so much of <laughs> positive thought in education, when uh, government policy changes and they say that you know international education is not really the way for Indonesia to go, or English language education, uh, how would this um, how would this affect Indonesian youth in the future and their employability and their skills? Great. And could we just squeeze in that last question if uh, the questioner is alive and among yeah. us? Thank you. Quickly as you can, sir, because our clock is beginning to run <laughs> against us. All right. yeah, so we Go on, make it class. up. You can do it. <laughs> um, my question is... Um, uh, aimed to the uh, Deputy Minister of Education, where he's talked about um, business being linked toward, to, to education. I want to ask you, sir, where predominantly, uh, if we're talking about the Asia-Pacific region, and uh, here predominantly the, the uh, education is a job-oriented education, and therefore, while talking about establishing the link between business and education, by the time a student is trained for a set of skills for a particular industry or for the industry mm. in general, 
by the time he finishes uh, college or his education, we find, they find that the whole set of skills have all drastically changed. So your comment on that? Very, very good question indeed. Uh, I think as the time is really tight towards the end, why don't the members of the panel just focus, please, on, on whichever question seems right for them, but let's try to uh, cover all of them if we could. Uh, Idris, would you like to select uh, from that lot? And you can give one or two answers as long as you're pretty brief. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would say that uh, education shouldn't be a political tool to the country because we are, we are developing we have to develop the human resource, which is number one in the country. And I do believe that uh, everybody should be given quality education. Accessibility to quality education is very important to the development of, of the country. And uh, private sector should be able to play a role in the development of education in the country. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Kamaludin, there was a question, I think, directly yeah. to you. Would you like to take that one? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, education is always politic in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. That's frankly speaking. The result of political decision is make the education change. And also, it's happened. During the colonial era, until now, it's happened. Okay? That is the reason why politics you cannot avoid with the education itself. Let's say the government policy of the next 20 years, they want to do so-so. And then they think, okay, education must be policies like that. This is the case, yeah? And also, Indonesia, like I mentioned in the beginning, since this Indonesia big country, they are comfortable with their own. That's why we say in work looking. There's a danger of in work looking because in the era of globalization today, English is very important, that is true. That will affect the youth. But the spirit of entrepreneurial in Indonesia today is very high. So the good student, they don't want to go with the government anymore, work with the government. They want to develop their own business and own enterprise. And to doing so, they really understood English is number one and computer is the second, must be in hand. Otherwise, they cannot survive. That is the spirit I watch in Indonesia today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deputy Minister, do you, yeah. do you like to have your concluding yes. thoughts and questions? Yeah. In my opinion, effective, relevant, and good quality TVET uh, contributes to productivity, strengthens a nation economy, and its best offers a variety of flexible opportunities for education and training that leads to decent work and careers for the nation people. So TVET helps build both social and economic prosperity. It builds good lives, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. That leaves us with uh, Guangzhou Kim. I'm just going to quickly summarize, if you could just try to hit these, I think it's only fair to the question is the political football question, uh, mm. how, how do you get around that? Uh, it, nobody took on the question about competing philosophies, which I think is rather a good one, that there tend to be many competing philosophies. Is it better, in a way, to try to uh, embrace a bit of all of them or to, to choose one? And then there was the, the question, which I think about most weeks I write about the issue, if you are teaching sort of skills for the marketplace, how do you know that effectively you're not teaching uh, spinning before the loom, really, and that you're going to be caught up by advances? Okay. Yes, uh, well, we as an international entity, yes, we do try our best to, to prevent education from becoming, as you say, a political tool. Uh, one approach, one obvious approach for us to promote this universal value, including a right based approach, human rights, justice, tolerance. Uh, mutual understanding, and so on and so forth. That is why I say we need to look beyond just well, hard skills, you know, cognitive skills, to embrace non-cognitive transversal skills whereby we can teach youngsters to understand better each other, not at, uh, in a given side, but uh, beyond the society. And, and for that matter, I would say education is no longer a domestic or national issue. It has become a transnational issue already because Good education can benefit all of us, while, and, and the, the reverse is also true. So education uh, has to be for jobs, of course, and, for, and education has to be for life, uh, of course, uh, in general. 
and the private sector has to work with the public sector to better define the quality education, and the state, in my view, has to provide a space for pro private entities to try new ideas and new, new philosophy and so on so forth. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think we're running to the end of our, our time, um, unless we're all going to break the Dubai land speed record to get to our, our next session. Uh, I thought that was an absolutely fascinating session because it took on so many different views, but a number of common themes like the balance between innovation and the role of the state and the role of science and technology and to the extent to which it is, as I think Pro Professor Kamaludin uh, mentioned, almost irresistible. So the question is no longer do we resist it, or, but, but what do we do with it? And I also thought very much enriched by having the perspective of a colleague from Myanmar with us, you know, talking about a very different situation and from Malaysia to hear about a system which has been very stable, but I think is well aware that it needs to make the next steps if it is to, uh, to keep pace and advance uh, within education as it has in, in so much else. Um, someone once said that the most terrifying words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And I think today has been a very good counterproof that uh, we've had uh, two very, very interesting perspectives from government and two perspectives from outside government, which often offer an, an extra angle and it perhaps an extra spur to the next phase of development in these Asian countries and beyond. So thank you very much for coming, for your attention and your extremely good and shrewd questions, but most of all to our panel who did the hard work. Thank you.